Namaste. 38. It was 38 years ago, exactly, that I began the meditation retreat that would lead to the first stage of enlightenment. I was in Portland, Oregon. I had just been on the Rancho Rajneesh in Oregon for about six months. And during that time, Osho or Rajneesh, uh, he never gave me anything to do, any work. So I just stayed out in the desert in a building all by myself and did a lot of meditation. I would go in the morning, I would go into the center and have breakfast and do dynamic meditation. And then I would go in the evening and have dinner and do kundalini meditation. And then during the day, I would just wander around in the desert or actually more often sit in my room and just meditate. And um, after a while, the other devotees, the other uh, so-called sannyasins, uh, picked up on this and they got envious and threw me out. So I went back to my place in Portland and I just sat. <laughs> it's hard to explain my mood at that time. I was fascinated. I was very interested in what was going on inside. I think for the first time in my life, my mind was quiet. My heart was satisfied. I was fine with being there all by myself. Didn't crave anyone's company. And I was just looking inside. I had no agenda. I wasn't following any particular style of meditation other than just sitting and watching within. And over a period of about six weeks, from now or eight weeks until uh, December 31st, that's all I did. I sat, started with about four hours a day and gradually worked my way up to about 16 hours a day, just sitting. And so much stuff was going on. Kundalini was rising, chakras were opening up. Uh, I was getting all kinds of visions of emptiness and space and all kinds of deep realizations. But I was just the watcher. I wasn't doing any of this. It was just happening. There was no plan, no desire even. I was just there, being and watching. So on December 31st, 1984, at about 12.15, I had just had lunch. And I was getting ready to sit back down again. <laughs> and I felt a presence in the room. At this point, I was so sensitive from all this meditation that I could feel the presence of people, for example, throughout the entire apartment building where I was staying. Small apartment building, about 20 apartments. And I could feel them come and go uh, when they went to work in the morning. It was wonderful because the building was practically empty. And I was just sitting there all by myself in this big building, lots of space around. And so anyway, I felt a presence in the room. And I was like, how is it possible that somebody is here? Because I knew all the doors and windows were locked and closed. And uh, there was no way anybody could get in without my knowing about it. But I still, I felt a very 
uh, strong feminine presence in the room. I couldn't see anybody. And suddenly I felt a tap on my forehead. And boom! Suddenly I could see Brahman. I could see consciousness. I could see that the world was interpenetrated with Brahman. And that Brahman was in everything and everything was in Brahman. It's impossible to describe. Suddenly I could communicate with plants and trees and even rocks. But <laughs> strangely enough, not human beings. Human beings were like cardboard cutouts, dead, static. Just, you know, this vision or this awakening went on for hours and hours. I was just in bliss. You know, but I'm always very skeptical of my mind. So I decided to test it. I went to a local tea shop. And, oh, the plants in the tea shop were like, you know, hi. <laughs> but the people were, like I said, cardboard cutouts, just two-dimensional, flat, not there. And so I, I waited in, uh, in the line to get served for a while, observing all this. And then I said, what if I really test this? It's like nobody registered my presence, no, none of the human beings. The plants did. <laughs> And uh, so I, I decided to make a test. I got out of the line and I cut up to the front of the line and I served myself a cup of tea and added honey and cream, creamer and picked up the cup and walked out. <laughs> and nobody made a move. Nobody batted an eyelash. Nobody said a word. So I went, hmm. This happened again later. I went to a, a local yoga center. And as soon as I walked in, all the people, the, the lady, were all ladies in the yoga center, got up and walked away and went in the back room somewhere and started chattering about nonsense. And I said, oh, this is weird. And it was really weird because animals and plants were like perfectly happy to see me. And so I just went back to my place and I just sat for some more. That was the first great awakening. And I didn't really understand what was happening. Uh, I had a background in Vaishnavism and of course Christianity and uh, Western philosophy and science. And uh, I was a musician by trade. Um, so that was my background. And nothing in it prepared me for what I was experiencing. So I had to file a lot of it under unknown to be determined. <laughs> and it took me about 30 years to get the background knowledge to understand my experience. It wasn't until I went to Sri Lanka and started to study the Buddha's teaching, not Buddhism, but the Buddha's teaching, the original sutras. And I found a wonderful teacher, Bhikkhu Nyanananda. He's passed away now, unfortunately. But he was very wise and extremely well-educated and realized. And he was the one who, uh, first one actually, who validated my realization and said, oh, that's first path. <laughs> he got it immediately, first path. And uh, that had the effect of revitalizing the entire experience, the entire realization and bringing it into present time and making it real. 
So then, by after studying with him for some time and continuing meditation, in the next three years, I had two more awakenings, second path and third path, in the context of the Buddha's teaching. And I look at these as a quintessential Raja Yoga experience. Uh, that, first of all, that this world is simply an appearance, an illusion. That's the second path. And the third path is that the identity, the so-called uh, empirical individual, doesn't really exist. That's a big one. That's a doozy. <laughs> and so... After I had gone as far as I could with the Buddhist teaching, I wandered for some time and I wound up in Tiruvannamalai. Tiruvannamalai, South India, the home of Ramana Maharshi and his uh, teaching and his institute, Ramanashramam. And there I studied the Advaita tradition, the South Indian Advaita tradition, which is probably the most um, pristine and original. And also I took initiation as a Shakta, sannyasi, from a follower of Shakti. And uh, after worshipping her in many ways, you can see the videos on this channel, some of the older videos. I, uh, how can I say this? I somewhat sneakily, <laughs> very quietly, got fourth path. I'm not sure how it happened exactly, but suddenly I knew that I was Brahman. And this was the first uh, encounter that I had with Shiva during this time. It was, must have been, 2021 must have been 2018, February, January or February 2018, confirmed. <laughs> it was Mahashivaratri. And, you know, I, I'm not really a big one for holy days and celebrations and um, festivals and stuff like that. I don't really much like crowds. And so I was just keeping to myself at my place. And I went to sleep. But around midnight, I woke up. And I found myself in a very strange space. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, in this space, Shiva was there. And Shiva was uh, present and showing me all kinds of things. And the main thing he showed me that really stuck with me was that he is Arunachala. At, at this time, I didn't know uh, in detail the background story of Arunachala, how it came from the, the unlimited lingam that manifested in the beginning of the universe when Brahma and Vishnu were having a fight. I didn't know that uh, that Shiva, at the request of Shakti, then made this lingam into a mountain and put it on earth so that this incident would always be remembered. But I found out later, uh, in this night, Shiva just showed me that he is Arunachala. And then he showed me something else that kind of blew my mind. He showed me that I am also Arunachala. I didn't know what to make of this. And so I went on with my studies and meditation and worship of Shakti. And one thing led to another. After the COVID epidemic, uh, I had been 
basically st stuck in the tier of an amelie for a year and a half and used the time to build up a nice meditation practice. And then suddenly the government of India changed the policy and I was informed I had five days to leave the country. And there was no indication of when I would be allowed back in. So I went to Sri Lanka and stayed with my friends in Sri Lanka. And I had to leave behind a whole house full of stuff, furniture and equipment and all kinds of stuff. And all of that was lost. But anyway, I stayed in Sri Lanka for about six months. And then when I came back, I wandered again. I didn't feel like going back to Tiruvannamalai even though I could have. I felt like my time there was at an end. It was time for something new. So I started exploring North India and through a series of coincidences, <laughs> I ended up here in the mountains in Uttarakhand. And this was the time when I really got serious about worshiping Shiva. Now, previous to this, back in like 2000 or, 2000 or 2020 or 2021, Shakti had appeared to me in a dream, which happened a lot in those days, and promised me that I will bring you to the feet of Shiva. And at the time it was like, oh, okay, but I'm really just happy worshiping you. But anyway, somehow, suddenly, <laughs> when I was in Rishikesh, Shiva Bhakti bloomed in my heart. There's no other way for me to describe this. It's like, of course, I knew about Shiva and I had studied about Shiva and so on, so on over a period of years. But all of a sudden, I had Bhakti for Shiva. Just the name Shiva made me feel happy. And I was getting thrills just thinking about worshiping Shiva. And I purchased a Shiva Lingam and all kinds of paraphernalia and uh, started doing the worship and so on. And chanting the five syllable mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. So this was only two months ago. But during that time, Shiva appeared to me in a vision and invited me to merge with him. This is a big deal because this is Sayuja Mukti. So I took this very seriously, although I wasn't ready at the time. I continued my worship and sadhana along the same lines. And oh, I should mention that over the last couple of years, the number 38 has become very prominent in my life. You know, like things would happen at 38 minutes after the hour. You know, I, I mean, over and over again, multiple times a day for a long time, a couple of years, every day, 38, 38, 38. I grew up in a house in New Jersey the house number was 238. So I thought maybe it was related to that. But anyway, it was definitely some kind of synchronicity. And I uh, found out, of course, now <laughs> what it really means. And uh, so anyway, after coming back, after being in Rishikesh for a month or so, I came back here to Uttarakhand, the village and continued my sadhana and chanting, studying, uh, making all these videos on Shiva Purana, which, by the way, is very delightful because of what I mentioned in the last video about Manasa Puja. So even if not doing the elaborate rituals, simply by reading about it, narrating those chapters, recording, editing, and distributing them, I was getting tons of punya and amazing ecstasy and so on. So
so then just last night <laughs> I woke up about 1.30, which I haven't been doing lately. For about the last two weeks, I've been sleeping through the whole night, which is very unusual for me. Usually I wake up about 1.30 or 2 o'clock and meditate. But I haven't been doing that. I just, you know, go to sleep, hit my head, hit the pillow, and blam, I was out until like 5 in the morning. Uh... I could not meditate. Normally, I have no problem. I just take one breath and I'm in. <laughs> really? Oh, come on, people. But last night, I could not get into it. So I started to analyze what's going on. And what was going on was that I could not find any objective for my consciousness. No object to meditate on. Everything I could find was a subject, was the self, was me. So this now, now this kept me up for a while. <laughs> but oh I should mention oh yeah about 2 weeks ago before I started sleeping all night what happened was I had another vision of Shiva and I accepted his invitation to merge with him just to see what would happen. And there was a delightful kind of mingling of himself and myself and that's when things changed see often the uh, events in self-realization are so subtle that first of all it may be hard to even believe that they happened they seem like dreams or fantasies or maybe imagination. It takes some time to gauge the effects of these subtle events, mainly through their effects. And uh, it takes the time to see the changes as you integrate those changes with the complete mentality which can be quite extensive. How does it change our perspective on things? How does it make uh, things look differently? Uh, or how does it impact our behavior, our desires, and so on? So in this case, the first real indication of any change due to this merging with Shiva is that I can't find anything objective anymore. The world doesn't exist for me anymore. At least it doesn't exist in the same way that it did before. I can't find anything that's objective, that's different from the self, which is myself. Another way to say it would be I feel like I am everything, and yet I am nothing. I am not an ego. I am not an individual. Beautiful bird song, huh? I don't feel like I have a separate existence or desires or the need to be anything or do anything. And I mean, I've had these kind of feelings for a long time, really since I got uh, deep into meditation. But now, they are not the 
result of any process or sadhana, they are simply the way it is, without any effort. So now I understand the poem written by Tulsi Das, where he says, Goodbye to my chanting mantras every morning, and so long to the rituals of worship and sadhana. And my dear gods and demigods, I'm very sorry, but I will not be able to continue <laughs> making offerings and prayers. Uh, and he goes on and on like this. I, you know, I'm not really attracted to studying the Vedas anymore. Uh, I really don't want to uh, make disciples or preach or teach or anything like that. Since I discovered the ever new and fresh bliss of being one with you, my Lord. beautiful poem and it, it pretty much expresses the way I feel right now so what does this all mean <laughs> I'm not sure yet I'm not sure yet how it's going to change my life but I have some hints from uh, various sources uh, especially intuition that I'm going to take more responsibility about helping people advance spiritually. And that doesn't mean becoming a guru, huh? especially in any traditional sense. But it does mean getting out more and mixing with people and uh, trying to influence them and help them in various ways to advance spiritually. And it's already happening. Uh, you'll see in the next few weeks. I'm getting ready to leave here in a couple of days and go to uh, Sri Lanka. So that means a long, onerous trip down to Delhi and then getting on the airplane and going through all the immigration and all that garbage. Uh, once I'm in Sri Lanka, of course, they're in the middle of a crisis. But I have good friends there, and I'll be able to stay there peacefully and digest this experience and try to grasp its meaning, its practical significance, and what kind of changes it means for my life. So right now, what it means is that I won't be posting videos for the next few days while I travel and get set up in my new location. And uh, even that may just be temporary, I'm not really sure. So uh, the last time I didn't post for a few days, people started asking, well, what's wrong? <laughs> Nothing's wrong. <laughs> I'm just gonna be busy with other things, with life in general and traveling in particular. And especially just observing as I go through uh, the familiar routines of traveling and so on, how my perspective has changed, what the meaning of this uh, feeling of merging with Shiva really is and the impact that it's going to have on my life. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>